member of Harbor Chapel for almost 10 years now. Um, and I've known Mother Hickman all the, the time that I've been here at the church. Mother Hickman is one of the founding members of Harbor Chapel, uh, from my understanding. She uh, helped to build uh, the old Harbor Chapel and also to keep the new Harbor Chapel growing. If you look at this church, you'll see the back part of the church where the pulpit uh, is, that that's more brick. That's kind of the old part of the church. And this was the sanctuary, probably went back to maybe halfway this room. Mm. And Mother Hickman and other members uh, were the founding members of this church, and they built this church. They built it in stages. As they got money, they built it, bought the land, and then built the church. And so we're, as members of Harbor Chapel, we're really proud to say we don't have a mortgage on our church. We own our church free and clear. And as long as we can keep our you know, lights on and heat and water, then we've got a place where we can worship. Mother Hickman was an avid reader. She knows a little bit about everything. It was very important to her that kids be educated. She started one of the first reading circles over at Cogdale Recreation Center. After that, she went back and got some training and became a Head Start teacher. And there are literally hundreds, if not thousands, of young people in this community that had Mrs. Hickman as their Head Start teacher. And so that kind of lets you know how long Head Start has been around. When young people or people come back to Flagstaff, they come to visit Mrs. Hickman, no matter where they come from. That just shows you the kind of relationship that she establishes with people. Um, and 30 years later, they're still coming back to this church looking for her. The actual school, uh, the old Dunbar school is gone. The only piece that's left is the part that's probably right out closest to Butler. They had to tear that part of the building down when they widened Butler. We tell people all the time that we sit on the site of the old Dunbar school and that itself has significance. The city, thankfully, wanted to pay you know, honor to the community and to a person who had been an integral part of that school and that community. And Cleo Murdoch uh, had been one of the teachers at the Dunbar School and one of the uh, principals. Uh, and so they named the, the, the center, the recreation center, after her. Anytime you, you, you go into a community, and a community um, fights for something that's theirs and you have a group of people who say this is not important we'll just put up a little plaque on a park and and that should be significant for you um, you know and people have to say no that is not right this this building is too important this is too important to our community to destroy it, to sell it. If you look at the Murdoch Center, and you look up at the people and all the programs and activities and events that happen in, this, in that building, it does bring community together. I think that we had to save it for future generations so that they would not forget the history that has taken place in that building, in this community. People have to understand that you know you build community kind of one person at a time and mm -hmm. one event at a time, one activity at a time. Flagstaff is a community. You know, mm -hmm. it has the 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 South Side has been a community for years. I mean, since the early 1800s or whatever, when the when the lumber mill was there. Mm -hmm. And so I think that you still have people in Flagstaff who understand that history, who want to be a part of building something nice. Coral Evans, um, Lynn Dorsey's granddaughter. Um, this house has been here since 1942. My grandfather built this house, and I'm really, really proud of that fact. And I inherited the house from my mom. My grandfather was originally from Louisiana. My grandmother was also originally from Louisiana. My grandmother, Floyd Dorsey. They didn't meet until they got here to Arizona in McNary. He came to Arizona by way of the sawmills. This was in the 1920s, the early 1920s. They needed people to work in the sawmills, so they would send school buses, actual school buses, back down south, and they would talk about 
the fact that Arizona was a free it was a free state, mm-hmm. how there were opportunities for African American black people, how it was a great place to live and you know start over type of things. And so my grandfather jumped on one of those um, school buses and ended up in McNary, Arizona. They heard that there was a sawmill, Southwest Lumber, I think it was Southwest yeah. mm-hmm. was the last name of the mill, but they heard that they were paying something like three cents more an hour. Um, mm-hmm. and they thought it would be a better life to come mm-hmm. to Flagstaff and start working for the lumber mill here and um, managed to save the money to buy property in the south side of town the fathers to be at that time decided that you know you need to have a place for these people to live um, it wasn't appropriate for them to live on the north side of railroad tracks mm-hmm. right and I guess every city in the United States of America must have I guess a south side right where you you relegate all the people who are a different ethnic persuasion and for some reason it's always on the south it's always south of railroad mm-hmm. tracks this particular area of the south side mm-hmm. um, there's a name in Spanish I believe it's called Los Chantes and it means the boneyard and what's really sad I guess in a way is that when they were looking for how to house or how to develop or where to put all these people. Um, this was actually, this area was a, um, a cemetery, a Native American cemetery. And so they actually came in here at that time and they removed that cemetery and they plotted up the land and marked it, mm-hmm. called it the Booker T subdivision, okay. and started selling plots. My grandfather was able to buy a plot here and he was able to buy a plot and build a four bedroom, one bathroom house $425. That was a big deal back then. The house was built out of uh, leftover scrap lumber from the mill. Well, my grandfather worked for the sawmill his entire life. On the side, he was a carpenter. So a lot of the houses that you see up on, on North San Francisco, like at the very top, are those brick houses that are made out of flagstone. My grandfather built a lot of those houses that are up there. They're the three main ones that were there. He built a lot of houses around this area. And so in the side, he was a carpenter. And then I guess on the side of that or in between, he also gardened. My grandfather, the whole entire backyard, the side yard of this property, when I was a kid, was like an urban farm. It was a garden. I didn't even know that vegetables came from a grocery store. I thought literally they came from your yard because that's where we got everything from. So, you know, I didn't really understand the concept of a grocery store until I was like much older. My Aunt Jo applied to become an airline stewardess, which in the 50s, that was amazing. It's my understanding that she got denied. The first time she turned her application, they denied it because you weren't going to have a black airline stewardess. It just, I mean, it hadn't been done before. But it's my understanding, she applied to become an airline stewardess. They had like one of those recruitment things at the college. They're like, you know, you look really great on paper, but we kind of see you and that's a no. She reapplied like a year later. And at that particular time, whatever vibe was going on in, in the United States, they, um, they, were, they were ready to make a difference. At least American Airlines was ready to make a difference. Mm-hmm. And so they hired her. Um, they accepted her into their, their program. And she graduated, she was the first um, neg- negress. I have a problem with that word because I just don't even understand it. She was the first black airline stewardess um, in, in the United States to fly for any um, major airline, like any airline, period. I think she was Amer- with American Airlines for like almost 30 years. And about five years ago, she was um, inducted into the Hall of Fame for American Airlines. She's in a museum. They have a museum in Fort Dallas, Fort Worth, Texas. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. My grandfather called Spring Hill. That was my grandfather's church. First Missionary Baptist Church. Um, when my grandmother died, she was the oldest member of that church. My brother went to Riverside, which is right over here. My Aunt Jo and my Aunt Helen um, were all baptized at Our Lady of Guadalupe. We went to Bible school at Harvard Chapel when there was still the pastor's house was still attached to it. When I was a kid, I mean, I grew up in all the churches. On Sunday, we would be either in First Missionary in um, Spring Hill. Every Tuesday, we would be at Our Lady Guadalupe saying a novena to St. Jude. I I think, um, of course, I wasn't here, but I think the reason why you have four different black churches here in this mile radius is because they weren't allowed to be anyplace else and because all the black people were on this side of the tracks. In talking with people, and just from what I remember, you know, there were Native American people here, but even within the South Side, I guess you could say the South Side itself was segregated. This area maybe had the, the, the black people in it. This area was kind of designated, I guess, for the Native American people. You know, this section over here, this is going to be where the Hispanics are. Um, and so it was really interesting because when you talk to people, everybody works in the mill, everybody's yeah. doing their own thing, everybody's together. And then the whistle blows, everyone goes home to their section. Basically, the South Side got created, I think, for some really poor reasons. The South Side got created as a place to 
house people that were necessary for labor, but maybe not necessary for anything else. Well, I'm really proud of the South Side. I think that the South Side has just, I mean, to me it's home. Like, I purposely live here. I could live anywhere in Flagstaff, but I purposely live here in the, here in the South Side because this is my neighborhood. I love this neighborhood. You know, you is in the middle of the South Side. I think sometimes we struggle with that, but the fact of the matter is, is that in the middle of South Side is like a really prestigious university. Um, if you look at the people who came out of the South Side, for lack of a better word, you have some people that have gone on to do some phenomenal stuff. Even they were in this little environment that I guess on the surface is was negative. Segregation is really bad. It's horrific. Prejudice, racism, and all that. But somehow you had a community here anyway. And within that community there was everything that those people needed to grow up and go on to live like pretty awesome lives. You look around and you see the fact that these buildings look run down. That you know there was a while where the university students didn't really appreciating the neighborhood, so to say, so to kind of work that out. The real flag issue. So you still see the effects, what, 50, 60, 70 years later of racism and prejudice. But even with all that, it's a pretty awesome neighborhood.